I just want to see if anyone else wants to speak with this card series. If I can have everyone's attention, please. We're ready to start the second half of the evening. Uh, before we do so, Laura's running around for last minute business card draw. So if you haven't put your business card in the, the barrel, Laura over here is walking around. Um, last chance to do that. So see Laura before you sit down. Um, and I welcome everyone back into their seats for the second half of this evening. Everyone's got their business card in the drawer. We can help you do that. Yes. The, do it. the prize um, is donated this evening from UCI. And UCI, Nick from UCI has told me that um, the, the wonderful prize tonight, you can see it down the front, is some rotational molded plastic boxes you put your bum on. That was my best English accent. It wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, who's going to do the honours? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I have no business. I, I, I don't have a business, so I don't have a card. <laughs> Not that one? <laughs> oh, come on. Our winner is... Well, he, she is a showroom consultant. I'm liking that. Um, Tristan Mather. Mayor? Mayor? Oh, yay. <laughs> Tristan, I seriously think you should talk to the people around here because they said to put it back in. Yeah. That's really bad. Bad energy. Bad energy. <laughs> Excellent. Congratulations. Thank you to um, UCI for donating that prize. Okay, we've only got Over to you, minutes. Mark. 15 minutes. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> wow, 15 minutes left, guys. And we're going to have to question three. <coughs> I have a seven for question one or two. Okay. Mm, to the audience, question three. Has IP, now we all know what IP means, don't we? Yes? Yes? That's a yes, I'm yes. not sure oh. they do. <laughs> I had no I bloody idea on the bus over here from New Farm, and I'm thinking, mm, idiotic pancreatitis, or <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Has IP become a buzzword in the, the profession? I think it's the design profession. Audience, has IP become the buzzword? No, if you say yes, you've got to put your hand up, seriously. Okay, is it a yes or a no? Okay, so you're all no's. So IP has not become a buzzword. John, you have to be so important. Okay, okay. So I think the no's have won. Um, panel has IP become a buzzword in the field admin? Clearly. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, you can't say anything. You have to show a card. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, no. No, no, no. Oh, awesome. We've got yes, three yeses and three no's. No, no, I'm, no, sa I'm saying. He's abstaining. I'm saying no particular judgment. Okay, we won't worry about you. Um, <laughs> pick, pick a side. Andrew, why are you a no? I, I was kidding. Andrew, why a no? Because most people don't know what it is in the design profession. And um, we've right. got to work really quick and really fast <laughs> because we're, uh, we're setting the stonework for um, very shaky times if, if the word intellectual property uh, in all of its publishing implications, all mm. of its furniture, everywhere around the creative process isn't documented uh, and people can 
we are safe. We are finding more and more designers leaving Australia because there is no respect for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, dare I say, Mark Newson, who is one of our top designers, um, left for many reasons having to do with intellectual property. Yeah, yeah. He couldn't and get so many years ago too. Much and many years ago. Twenty years ago, at least. It was about yeah. 1990, 1987. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think a lot of designers are happy being here and working here, but they don't feel protected. So, Andrew, I think it's important that you answered this one as first thing, that um, in terms of being an auctioneer, how important is your, how important is IP um, to your potential clients? Are they, are they, are they really concerned? Um, not directly with the the word intellectual property, their concern is only going to be really in the three-dimensional product. Sure. Yeah. Where it affects, yeah. again, back to the words of authenticity. Mm. I, I suppose it's my exposure into the bigger design world where I'm amazed what people give out for free. And, um, and I think nonchalantly say, oh, if it gets copied, it gets copied. There's nothing I can do about it. Sure. Where yeah. none of that happens in a lot of other countries. And I think it's just because artists um, who I put in the same category or the same profession as designers. I think they're very much equal now, the artist and their designer are all being forced with things like this copy, um, mm -hmm. resale mm -hmm. royalties. All these are coming in as protective bodies and yeah, yeah. the design profession has none at the moment. And Richard? Uh, are we working at the moment with quite a number of Australian designers? And it's been interesting because I've thrown the intellectual property contract arrangement back to them versus us giving them one. And it's I'm very, very surprised at how little yeah. they are, well, firstly, they know, and B, it's even a clause in a contract that you ask them to give you. Okay, so just to get this straight, you're dealing with Australian designers. Yes. You're getting them to design for you. Yes. Yeah. Um, you are then saying to them, it's your intellectual property and we will manufacture? Ma yeah, manufacture and, okay. and distribute. Well, is, is that not a, um, a, a, a left side, right side, um, romanticist, pacifist, Apollonian, Dionysian divide where about self -esteem. the designers who are so creative don't know about the business side? Self-esteem. Well, no, it's not the business side they're talking about, really. They're talking about intellectual property. And what I'm actually saying is that, in a sense, I own, in this case, the rights to sale, sell, market, and produce the products. Yeah. But in the contracts, there's nothing there that says that should that not work out, that they own the intellectual property, number one. Number two is they don't protect it, so they ask us to do it, right? Now, in my mind, they should do it, we should reimburse them. Absolutely. as part of the contract, mm. but it should be done by them, not by us. So how can you infringe my design um, proposals or intellectual property? Well, it depends on who registers the design at the end okay. of the day. Okay. So what I'm saying is that, you know, Irv Gillies designs a product, gives it to me to sell, I turn around and go register it. I mean, I would have thought the designer, and, you know, obviously we go through this, but I'm just saying we're very much about authentic design. So we're pointing them in the right direction. Mm. How many other people are just taking it and saying, look, just sign here, and and they've lost, in a sense, their intellectual property. It's been signed over. And I think, I mean, I, I see it. I mean, I saw it today. We, we, we had something done in our showroom, which wasn't anything about design. It was about a, a test on something that was in the mm. showroom. I got this document from a non-design company that said that they own the intellectual property that they provided us. Wow. And I was thinking, my God, I should probably photocopy this and send it to some of the designers <laughs> that we deal with. And this was part of the deal. Mm. Okay, so do we need to make it easier in terms of uh, legalities for, for creative producers of any kind, fashion, you know, object, um, furniture, um, fabric, you know? Um, I know from my own experience that I don't want to deal with all that kind of stuff. I'd rather employ 
Mark, you want Mark, Mark, talk about it earlier. It's about you, you, really you can deal with this sort of stuff. You, if you, you're smart enough to be a designer, you're absolutely smart enough to understand English as well. Oh Lord. Don't, don't pass it away. Don't think it's not your responsibility. Mm. It's absolutely your responsibility, mm. not only in a, in, a, uh, in a moral sense because you're the creator, but what we, we're failing to bring into proper uh, relief is this issue of governance, design governance, because we're in relationship. Designers have relationships with a whole range of people, mm. and they have responsibility to the people they have relationships with, principally their customers, so their clients. So when uh, uh, Mr. Ben Barnvell's client comes in, he, I think, has a legal um, and a fiduciary responsibility to be educating his clients about the registrability of the brands that he is developing on their behalf. Because it may well be that he hands over a brand that gets them sued if he doesn't do that. So I think it's an implicit part of the designer's brief. But neither AGDA, as far as I'm aware, nor the DIA have positions on intellectual property. Professional. I'll just throw to Paul who's, who's scratching yeah, his head over um, here for some strange reason. Yeah, well, I said yes that it is a buzzword, but I meant that in a good sense because there is a conversation yeah, happening is. within communication design that is actually acknowledging the value of inte intellectual property, but not only that, the value of the, the, you know, it's about the designers putting some value on themselves and understanding that they have worth within the business structure. And, um, you know, it, we're all about, and I said this before, a lot of us are working in a very commercial space we need to understand what our intellectual property rights are mm. Mm. and understand the value that we basically are bringing to the table. And I think that that's why, you know, that a buzzword can be a great thing because the more it's a buzzword, the more people are going to ask about it exactly. and the more people are going to yeah. learn about yeah. it. So, um, you know, there, it, it, it is disappointing to hear that designers don't understand their worth because that's what it comes down to in the end. It's about... Designers but valuing but that's themselves. Price. They have no understanding of the real world. No, well, it's like they're just you take, making stuff. take the. I always love the example of, um, you know, particularly in branding and things like that, or communication design, graphic design, whichever term you prefer, that, you know, we are screwed to the wall for basic graphic design <laughs> services. <laughs> Don't raise your eyebrow, Matt. Um, we're screwed to the wall on what we charge, and yet we are every day coming up with some new idea, new concept, new answer, a, 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 a reason for basically the designs we create and things, yet our lawyer friends have legislation that they can call on, yet they can charge you $600 an hour in six, in, in six minutes increments. So it's like, why aren't, when we're putting it out there all the time, we're constantly creating new things and designing and our intellectual property meter is going, you know, going working overtime we aren't charging the same the same for that because we don't value that and that's where there is that you know there's this lack of um, self-worth almost that designers can have that and it's not all the designers just to clarify that I'm not generalizing <laughs> okay. um, that don't understand their value and that's where the IP that's where the IP conversation comes in because that's where the value rests and yes, the design industry it does need to pick up. It's not that you're not worth it. It'll show you won't pay for it. That, that, that was the question. No, well, that, yeah. that is the point, but that's because we're not demanding because it either. they've gone away for free. So no, well, they have, but I mean, that's why we're not demanding it. So I when I do do a brand for a, uh, sorry, Mark, when I am developing a brand for a customer, that we have the conversation about the fact that I own the intellectual property in this. They, if they wish to purchase the copyright in the final outcome, that's on the table. Mm. But as far as everything else is concerned, that's mine. Absolutely. And that's a conversation we have up front. Yeah. And but not enough designers are doing that. This leads us back to, I think John mentioned, you know, the, the, the um, education of design students yeah. in unis or colleges. It should be at the uni. Uh, it should start at uni. <laughs> exactly. I, I um, and the should I agree? Yes, yeah. I agree. The, no, but the thing is, and I think that one of the fault of, um, and I can only speak from what I know of within the Queensland context, um, because some other schools are doing things very differently. You've got to get out um, there. Say what? You've got to get out there. Yeah, I do. <laughs> but I know that, for instance, in New Zealand, they're teaching people the value of property. Yeah, you know, yeah. The design schools are teaching people about intellectual yep, property. Yep. But there are too many design schools who are focused purely on the craft of design, when design is, and I keep saying this, that design is, a, is a, it is not about 
I mean, the craft is an outcome of that you deliver, but you know, we're delivering on people's briefs. We're delivering for a reason. We're answering somebody else's question that we need to you, we need to value that, but also work much more in a business context than we do. Look, I, th I feel that the Dan, uh, you missed that on last session. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, apparently, there's only two people that spoke. It would have been boring. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sorry, yeah, no, no, I, I feel that though that the, um, well, f for one, I have a clause on my quote, the first thing that goes out to the customers that says all intellectual property is retained by myself unless, the, you know, unless we invoke the conversation. And that's so that, you know, that, that ended up the, the point being that I do aim to have that conversation with my client as early as possible. Um, so, you know, despite what, what the uh, law, law man has said here, um, yeah, we are in fact, you know, even those so who don't have So why, why are customers coming to guys for a design solution which they can't use. Now, why would you be retaining intellectual property? Obviously, uh, you're well not pre 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 yeah, precisely. Pre hang, pre on, hang on. One I'm at a time. I'm curious. I'm curious as to why you. He's you selling might me your services as well. You might mind you. <laughs> <laughs> up, up, you I sir. Which one? Well, I can understand as a as a being a client and coming to Bjorn and saying, "I want you to design me the best jeans label ever," because mm -hmm. I'm making new jeans. Ob obviously, um, there's... And, and I'm giving you the whole creative um, direction here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I don't know. It's clear that the designer, the in the first instance, owns the intellectual property. But Design. it's also clear that the client walks out. If he pays you money, uh, or he, she pays you money, that client's going to walk out with a license to use that intellectual property. But yeah, you're talking absolutely. about in, you know, you license to use intellectual property? Or you like, is it a copyright of the final outcome? Because mm. they're two different things. So because I'm, I mean, I'm not the, sure. I, the intellectual property that I use, that I've developed to create a brand and understand, you know, if I come to you for a brand, take a client through, I'm not selling them that process. I'm selling no, no, no. them a final. Hold outcome. on, Paul. But but Paul, if I'm paying you, doesn't that give me the right to own most of it? No, because you're paying me for an outcome. Yeah, we should own the client. Should and that own outcome, the outcome uh, yeah, the client belongs to you or me. No, if they buy the, if they purchase the copyright, then they own it. Right. But they don't own the process. No, the no, process no, is mine. The process is yours. But the client obviously wants an interest in applying the solution that you deliver. Yeah. Okay. So that that distinction, the ones you're making, they're the sort of things that should be should be uh, explained at uh, to pro to young professionals earlier than when they get out of design yeah. school. So th and, and, the, and the, the point I was trying to make on, on my way of being railroaded there uh, <laughs> was that it should, it, should, it, should actually, you know, it should absolutely start before uh, design education. I feel like I was aware of the, the notion of uh, intellectual property, albeit not by that name, at even perhaps a high school level, doing, engaging in art class, understanding, that understanding, having an answer for why uh, and a piece of art artwork <coughs> that someone's, you know, how many times have you heard it? I, I could absolutely draw that, and then, or, or I could absolutely create that, and they probably could, but it's coming up with the idea of having to, of drawing that in the first instance, that is the intellectual property, and understanding that is something that, pe that people are, feel I are able to understand. Well, is, is that when you put, um, only two days ago on Radio National, you're discussing the guy that originally drew Mickey Mouse or something, or I, I can't recall, but in his first drawing, he just put C and a circle around it, and that belonged to him. Mm. So yes, I think IP is but yes, but yes, 1970s copyright. Right, right, of course. So this, this, the, the notion of, of understanding that an idea is protectable, I think, uh, comes on a lot sooner than design education. And if that did, in fact, come on as a, as, as a, a cultural understanding, we wouldn't have to charge what we charge. We wouldn't have to have this 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 um, this clause that I, for instance, um, invoke on the bottom of my quotations, mm -hmm. because you know we we we'd, be, we'd, we'd suddenly have a a, a, a a dialogue that not between a designer and a client where I, I understand IP and the client does not. We simply have a conversation yeah. as people that operate in a world where we, under, uh, where, where, where we understand that intellectual yes. property has value, yeah. and that's just as as it is. Does that mean? Yeah, that's that's Carol's or audience <laughs> question. Um, I think an audience question. Anyone want to know stuff? Give me, you know, if, if you don't understand a word they said, just <laughs> type it and then give me some trouble. This is a question. I'm not sure who to it is this time. Um, thank goodness. 
I might address this to Bjorn, actually. Um, Bjorn, do you feel there's any uh, direct relationship between the, uh, the ability, the tremendous empathy that's required of the best designers in terms of understanding true human needs and generating something which offers real solutions in this world and the inability to not really be able to charge um, uh, a significant financial uh, remunerative rate in exchange for that service. Are, we, are, are those sorts of designers destined to not earn a healthy income? And I might ask John to comment on that as well. Well, <laughs> to be quite transparent, I feel like uh, I might be one of those empathetic designers that doesn't have quite an, much of an income, <laughs> uh, wh which is precisely w uh, as a, uh, why uh, this intellectual property um, buzzword, or why actually, why, uh, and I did in fact say that it is a buzzword, I, I, I invoke it on the bottom of my quote be because I need to have that conversation. I need people to understand that it's, it's valuable uh, and to... to, to so, so almost, you know, almost for my own, for my own edification, that's just so that I, 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 can, I feel like I am. Um, oh how can I say? That I, I'm justified in what I'm charging because I, I, I do have this self-consciousness or in in in, in, uh, in charging for something that is not necessarily, or more often, not tactile. Is not tactile. Uh, and it's so yes, it's it's it's, it's challenging. I, I think you I think you're right. Um, maybe you are destined to be poor. Like as, as, as with artists, maybe you were right to put us together. <laughs> That's, I don't know. I think there's a, there's a vulnerability and an intimacy that designers display toward the distillation and satisfaction of their grief. Uh, maybe all professionals, doctors, chemists, whatever. C certainly it applies to, to, to designers. I think it's been touched on um, tonight, but th I think we've got a self-esteem issue here about about the value of design and where and, and, and what it's worth. Now, I, I'm not absolutely familiar with, with pricing in the design world. Um, what I'm curious about is the opportunities that are available to both designers and clients, and, and some of them are being explored by Richard with his group, to find models to make money out of copyright. And uh, Elliot certainly has put a lot of consideration into digital models of, of how money is made out of copyright. You can see these aggregation services are certainly screwing the, 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 um, the, uh, the musicians yeah, there in terms of payouts there. There's, there's no doubt that's occurring. So I, I think it's about copyright models. How do we, how do we, how is, how do money, is money made out of, out of copyright? Now, um, there's, there's a group of, of folk um, called copyright uh, rights collection agencies who, who collect on behalf of industries. Music's one of them. So for music to be played publicly in this country, in open air, live gigs, radio, TV, showrooms, showrooms, showrooms mm -hmm. th they, they collect on behalf of musicians and distribute 250 million bucks a year. Yeah. And, and they're, al they're also on the other, si other side, there are patent trolls who make their entire business around aggressively using patents to stifle innovation. I made an example in, in, the, in the intermission of, for instance, the pull to refresh um, gesture you use on your iPhone now. That is a patent owned by, uh, owned by Twitter as a side effect of buying Tweety, who was developed by one guy, one developer, who happened to get the patent about I think like one day before they signed the deal. So what, what you know, beautiful cherry on the top. And for the longest time, we didn't have pull to refresh under iOS because of the fear of, 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 um, of, of uh, litigation. And that's a company the size of Apple with all those cash stocks afraid of someone else using, a pa using an idea aggressively against them. And that is, I mean, that's a, 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 a place in where, you know, and the, the, uh, the, um, the, the emotionally sensitive egalitarian designer, in this case the developer of Tweety, has released something for a small, uh, small fee and now as, uh, as, as a side effect of law has become this nuclear strategy in protecting ideas against one another. That's the whole mobile technology industry at the current moment, though. Uh, no, of course, but all, all I mean to say is that, 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 that in, uh, you know, the, the, I guess, I guess because the, we have these laws in place, we're actually having to be more, ca more careful because, p because, because we have, we have, we have law, uh, law practitioners who understand that they can use things, things aggressively, 
and not that they aren't just for the sake of the designer. There's, you know, there, there, there are people putting food on their plates, and, and, and more than food, they're probably stacking Rolls Royces on their plates, <laughs> um, you know, using these things aggressively. And no, it's, not for the it's not for the greater good. Uh, and it's it's not for uh, it's not and, and, and is it, it 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 doesn't do what the patent system is meant to do, which is to say let's not have an industry secret. Let's actually put this out to everyone so everyone can see this and license it. Uh, no, it's it's nothing, it's there's nothing about licensing. Well, uh, and, uh, sorry, that, that, that's okay. Well, before we go into a thesis, um, any other questions from the audience? We've had one. Was your question answered correctly? I thought rather a priest. A, a priest. priest? But I, I prefer a non-secular service, John. <laughs> no, I, look, I, I totally agree on the priest. No, not the priest, the psychologist. But, you know, as a, as a creative um, who is, like, you know, romantic, and I have no understanding of, of law, you know, and, and strategy and all that sort That's of gonna stuff. That's going to change, Mark. I know, but I, I've, got, on a journey. I've got lawyer older brothers, which I, you know, but yeah, I, you know, as a creative, I don't, ha I don't think I need to do any of this stuff. But um, you know, firstly, we could have a mediator as a psychologist. Like, what do I do? Or I now know that as a valid creative, I could go to John as a solicitor and get good advice and be represented by him. But it's just that you know, that but romantic I think there's and classic. I think there's a group of fundamental concepts, basic building blocks of a business model that designers can absorb easily and I'm sure most of the folk if not all of them on the panel tonight uh, John, have done design, that. design, art, fashion, business don't collide at the intersection. Well and, and I think there would have been an interesting debate whether these issues were brought up last week um, because we have an interesting spectrum in Queensland at the moment about design education and I sense that none of these issues were explored carefully during last the debate of dialogue whether design integration, design thinking, intellectual property. I'm not sure no at certain institutions in this town whether those issues are getting legs at all. So mm. there's, there's a one preparation before they graduate, then they come out, and there's a whole new world for which they're not prepared. That's been tertiary education since the world began, though, isn't it? Well, Art school one would think that the university... School and we, we would hope for more in the university of the real world. We would hope that tertiary institutions are doing more to prepare young Australian professionals for the realities they'll inherit when they come out. Uh, as, as, ge as generalists, we're having more and more responsibilities placed on us, and, I, you know, and certainly intellectual property is one of them, but there, you know, I d also don't believe that it's, a, it's a, as I said earlier, something that should fall on the institutions to necessarily educate when we could be having this debate in in policy, you could be having this debate uh, amongst regular people, uh, so that we don't have to have this. this we, don't, we can understand that when someone when there, when there's no market for replicas, then we don't have to fight against them. When everyone understands the value of original uh, an original idea, then we don't have to protect against them, against against replicas. Right. Well, as a lecturer in design, you know, I, I, I my my whole thank you guys because. I, I'm now going to stay awake all night thinking about um, what we educate and what we don't educate on, you know? We're um, here to help you, Mark. What's that? We're here to help you. Oh, thanks, Tom. I'll ring you at 4 a.m. in the morning. I'm ready yeah, for yeah. your call. Great, great. He'll call Damn, I don't have your card. Six-minute intervals. Um, <laughs> guys, I have to say, um, this is my third gig, and this is DIA's third gig. Um, it just keeps getting better. You know, and I'm, I'm wrapping. Is it okay to wrap up here? No, yeah, thanks. you haven't finished, Mark. You've got two more questions. <laughs> oh, oh. Follow your, follow your stimuli. Oh, one more question. Okay, I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I'm just two. winging it here. Okay, Scott, so we should go to question six. No, question five. Okay. <coughs> A final question for the night is, what responsibility, if any, does the user forward slash consumer have to support originality? Are they even equipped to identify it? I think we've, have we not covered this? Great question. He comes up with these incredible questions. Uh, I'm sorry, I, 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 I just, I just I make these up in my head. I, you know, this is a I, fresh I, I, I claim responsibility for that one. You're not, we've got the thesis question. and we'll be here all night. 
what responsibility, if any, does the user, can, if I, okay, I'm going out shopping for a chair, okay, what responsibility do I have to support originality? And I'm a, am I even equipped to identify it? Well, I think we're in a relationship context there, because if you walk into a shop, you, sh you have the right to believe that whatever you purchase from that sh shop is safe for you to purchase. So if the shop is selling things which are infringing intellectual property, then you unwittingly will breach intellectual property. I want a, but I want a chair. I don't give a... You know, well, and you can have that chair yeah. unless the uh, person who designed the chair and owns the intellectual property in the chair that you're buying says you shan't have it. Right. Paul, what do you reckon? Um, I think you touched on it earlier that um, it's a cultural issue um, and that we can only talk in our own Australian context that um, we... I think I'll probably get shot for saying this since being recorded. <laughs> um, I think we're a little bit culturally ignorant and incredibly culturally immature when it comes to understanding the value of design, um, God, and yeah. that, um, and that you know we're to you know to for a consumer to walk into Matt Black and go, oh my God, these are all fakes, and <laughs> that word again. Um, well, that, that, that they're all fakes, somewhere. they're just going to go, cool, aren't these awesome chairs? And have absolutely zero understanding about what, it, exactly. what, it, what you know, the fact there's a replica or not, they probably don't know what a real Eames chair looks like. And wow, look at it, I'm paying 50 bucks for a chair, I saw these online for 300, awesome. Um, mm -hmm. Our society just doesn't appreciate the value of good design, mass-produced consumer products. Um, <laughs> I think that it, you know that there, there are people understand good design, but you know when it's on uh, when it's put out there and it's cheap, they're just going to go for it. Uh, yeah, in, in simple Don't terms, the N word. Um, yeah. Elliot, uh, look, I think I think this is an interesting one because the idea of responsibility I think is quite problematic here. You're you're sort of saying to a consumer market, it's your responsibility to know something that our industry and profession. Uh, creates as an idea and demonstrates through the quality of the work that we produce, um, I think that relies on the sector to know and understand their value and why they're valuable, to know and, and, and understand and protect the value in that, and to communicate that to the mm. consumer mm. body out there. I think a question like this is, is particularly problematic to sort of go, at this juncture, the consumer market is responsible for knowing good design. I think that's way too problematic because clearly they don't. And how do you transfer that into a responsibility? I think that's an yeah. exceptionally problematic uh, kind of situation. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think that's going to be fixed by by saying, right, you as consumers, it's your responsibility to do this. Yeah. I think. I mean, I think it is another education issue. I mean, I was livid today when I went to a design practice, and walked in and in the course saw two copies of my chairs. Now, in my mind, Damn. what chance do we have if the industry, I mean, obviously, if you don't value what fees you should be charging your clients, well, that really only affects you, not others. That's and in exactly my view yeah, is, I agree. you know, yeah. honestly, if you can't convince yourself to do it, then how can you convince mm. others? And, com and promote I mean, that. And the other thing that I think is quite interesting is that just recently we saw a schedule come through a designer, not a project manager who's got to deliver a job and, and he probably gets an incentive for doing it within or under budget, where it said option one for the life, the original. Option two, go to Matt Black. Now, in my mind, if the mm. budget was 300, you know, you could talk to many people to get your three hundred dollar life, mm. and it's original. Mm. And I think we have a responsibility, as part of that education process, to live. You know, it doesn't have to be an eight thousand dollar or six thousand dollar Eames. It mm. doesn't have to be as you know four thousand dollar Swan chair. Mm -hmm. But there are things out there that are original. Three hundred dollar chairs, one hundred and fifty dollar chairs. And I just think when we start to see it in the design profession, mm, mm. what chance have you got to say to your client, take them on the journey, oh God, yeah. talk about the 50 years that these things last? Yeah. How can you do that when, you sit, when the client looks at you and says, and where'd you get that from? Mm. I went to my mate, Matt. Mm. 
And, I, and, and honestly, I mean, I think. Andrew, your response? No, that was exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. That I've, I've had the um, interaction with more and more designers who are um, not educating mm. and allowing, um, now whether it is budget, but I, I was going to go back to the very first thing you said, that if it is the $300 budget or a $3,000 budget, buy something which is, a, which is mm. of the integrity that that client can say, well, I'm supporting an emerging designer. There's emerging yeah, yeah. artists, there's emerging designers everywhere uh, that are doing very, very beautiful things and support them rather than buying uh, rubbish. And um, yeah. I think that's the most important thing is that's got to come through from the design yeah, community. Well, let me look, we can look to Denmark again uh, and where their, uh, their Series 7 share, for instance, uh, which is the example you invoked earlier, um, it's, it goes to schools uh, as their, uh, in, um, because they make a 20 year plan, they do that now as they did 20 years ago and 20 years before that, uh, because they can buy it once every 20 years rather than ref refurbishing their school, school room, sc uh, classroom the, the way they do here every couple of years, they, they suddenly they can amortize the price of a more expensive object uh, much, more, much more easily. And, and, and beyond that, it, I, can, I can use that example of, of, my, uh, of my family members there as well. You, you just basically buying the originals because they understand. It, it really, I, I'm kind of resistant to this idea that this it, ha it has to come from designers. I feel like, it, it, I mean, I, having written that question, I, 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 I'm really interested to see the resu results, but I, I'm a, in, the, in the view that it is the, it is the, the, popula the, the, the population's responsibility yeah. and they're not yeah. equipped. It's it's and, and also, you guys were design educated from birth. Like, when I think, you know, I, I've, I've been thinking about this sermon art quite a bit the last couple of days, and I'm thinking, well, as Australians, you know, um, what design ethic did I grow up with? You know, none. Nah. Really. You know, I didn't, don't think about, well, I didn't growing up, but think about good furniture, you know, and and, and useful objects by designers where, um, you know, Danish people and Japanese people probably were. There's a, there's a very similar sensibility to it. But we don't have this, this notion of, you know, that's my, that's my Grant Featherston chair and I'm not going to let it go. And, and also this notion of, of, bu of buying uh, fewer items at a, at a higher price as well and as, as being the desirable yes. lifestyle. The, the quality over quanti quantity Absolutely. notion of... of Purchase, yeah, yeah. I think R Richard's uh, got something to say. If you um, I, I guess from my perspective, it's more about, I think if I asked the room who'd been to Bali and bought a copy watch, and I put my hand up and said I did the same when I was 17. Oh, we've got a couple of no's right. over here. Now, you know, the real fact of the matter is, what I noticed that when, was when you got back, you had that little glory thing, because you you had a copy Rolex for two months. Then that was landfill. Mm, and right. my view is it's no different. You well, can't some Rolex was purchased in Shanghai will last for more than a year. Yeah, I'm sorry, Richard. Okay, well, a year. <laughs> <laughs> a year. But, but really, if you go out and you buy a Rolex, you want it to be something that you could possibly hand down. Yeah, sure. Mm. sure. And I guess mm. that notion is something that people get. I mean, I, this is an analogy I always have when people come in the showroom. We sit there and we talk about an egg chair six, eight thousand dollars and and I say to the client, listen, what car do you drive? And most of them will say, if they've walked into our showroom, BMW, an Audi, whatever the car is. And I said, okay, what was it when you what did you pay for it? Fifty, sixty, eighty, one hundred and twenty. Okay. And what do you you sit in your chair to and from work. If you're lucky, if you live at the Gold Coast, an hour. So you get to enjoy it. If you live in New Farm and you go into the valley, it's ten minutes. Mm -hmm. But yet, with the traffic, but yet ah, you ah, have ah. lost, right? As you drive that car out of the driveway, you've lost twenty, thirty thousand dollars. And every time you drive another, no, no. <laughs> when you bought it, oh, okay. you bought it new for eighty. Right. Three months later, try and sell it for eighty. Yeah. You've lost three egg chairs, right? And Damn. People, people don't get it. It's mm. the value thing again. And, and I think, you know, they're the sorts of things that we all, not, not whether it's an egg chair or an orange chair or whatever it might be. So should I now do all my shopping based on egg chairs? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like or a swan chair. Yeah. Swan yeah. chair? Yeah. yeah. 
to organic. I'll go to the grain cut but instead. But that's <laughs> expensive. Well, I mean, I yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll shop it. I'll, I'll buy, um, you know, generic grain cut. I'll just use organic grain cut. Uh, well, I, I have a beautiful, I beautiful, beautiful, beautiful story again of an another um, uh, James, <coughs> James Peralta with a who, upon uh, confirmation, as you say, he would have been maybe oh, 12 or 14, you know, something in that, in that order. He saved up his confirmation money to buy his first Borg Morganson uh, rocking chair. And that, you know, if you think about what someone at 12 or 14 would do with that kind of money here, uh, it probably wouldn't be a Borg Drugs. Morganson. Ro no, it, would, <laughs> it, it probably <laughs> wouldn't be a Borg Morganson rock, rocking chair. Oh and God, no! And, 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 no, that, that no, and, no. and that and that shows that that cultural understanding and cultural appreciation of design that I feel uh, we we should should encourage and nurture uh, everywhere. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. where um, you know, no understanding of design until you get to university and you choose it. That's where we should really nurture. The, the the IP, yeah, and the legality, the the the, the, um, the love of design. Precisely in that in that model, we already have intrinsic design value. We already have uh, a, a good sense for aesthetics and proportion and whatnot. And and then, of course, and th then we have so much more time in our four years of education to address the more industry specifics of. Of, of IP and yeah, but growing up, you know, if you're a bloke who wants to have a Grant Featherston chair all your life, you're a pork. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's basically like no one worries about design or furniture. Jesus Christ! But Next, we'd be wa wanting to collect fashion. Referencing the BMW again, I mean, <laughs> they grow up wanting a BMW. Does that make them a pork? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So why can't they desire? Why is a chair any different to desiring a BMW? Exactly. Okay, are we taking questions from the audience again? No, stop um, shaking his head. <laughs> okay, <laughs> finally you get some direction. Um, but I'd just like to say, guys, yeah, thank you so much. Guy. It's been the best, my favorite um, dialogues ever. Um, thanks for turning up. Thanks for um, sharing and caring and being nice to each other. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, please, again, thank our panellists this evening. Gorn Rust, Andrew um, Shapiro, Paul Van Vardabold, John Kenny, Richard Bonao, and Elliot Leto. <laughs> thank you very much for your time. I think the, the conversation this evening has been very lively. We appreciate your, your time tonight. Um, you and your, me, your dialogue that you've contributed to our industry. Also, thank our wonderful... Um, adjudicator, um, uh, Mark McDean, for... Adjudicator? An authentic designer? Whatever. <laughs> thank you. Moderator. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, Mark. Mark has um, been our moderator for the series and um, has done a great job, so we really appreciate his time and effort. Just a quick couple of other thank yous. Dialogues wouldn't be possible without our sponsors, and we really appreciate their generosity and support for this series. Um, Ace, Stone and Tile... Gunnison, who have got some stands here tonight. If you haven't seen them already, do so before you leave. Um, Vertilux, Astaron, Plush Interior and Furniture Design, Cafe Culture and Caribou Boo Lighting. Please join with me in thanking them for their series sponsorship. Cool. Our in-kind sponsors this evening, UCI, KW Doggett, Harley, Vanderbilt's, uh, Worth Photography, More Print, Peter Lang Photography. Thank you for their in-kind contribution also. Thank you. Um, also to our wonderful committee that have worked tirelessly um, for the dialogue series this year. Um, Laura Stevens. Um, Linda unfortunately couldn't be with us tonight. She's our um, coordinator and um, for personal reasons she couldn't join us but she's here in spirit and we really appreciate um, all of her hard work. So Linda and Laura, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, they've been supported by our team at the door, Rebecca Yitt, um, Kim and um, Peter and everyone else on the council that's offered their support um, to come um, bring all this stuff together. Phil um, James is on camera tonight. Um, thank you very much for all of those as well. Um, uh, before we wrap up, um, we are going to... Uh, our um, prize winner of the UCI Lucky Door Prize, Kristen, has won a prize before and she's a bit in... Bit, bit embarrassed that she's won it twice in a row, so she's very kindly offered for us to redraw it 
Um, there's three stools on offer, so we're going to draw three business cards. So thank you, Kristen, and thank you, UCI. Um, we'll do a quick redraw. There you go, three cards all at once. Alison Peach from Vertilux. <laughs> Intelli Design, um, Jonathan. And Christy Oates. Congratulations. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, it's been a really successful uh, event for us, Dialogues. We really want to continue the um, discussion. So um, join us on Twitter, follow the con discussion on Twitter. Next year, we're going to relaunch the program bigger and better and do it all again. Um, if you've got any feedback, please send it through to us. Any ideas for some hairy, scary questions that we should um, talk about next year, please send that through to us as well. Um, and we're happy to look at those suggestions. Thank you very much and have a good evening.